Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. This is a prophecy conference, and it's a collaboration between Secrets Unsealed and Keep the Faith Ministry. We are thankful that you can be with us, and we're looking forward to a wonderful time together as we fellowship, not only in the Word of God, but with each other and with the Lord as we study His Word. So welcome. Thank you for coming. To begin with, let us bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the prophecies of the last days. And as we begin our prophecy series tonight, our conference, we pray that you will grace us with your spirit, your Holy Spirit, to teach us and show us what we must understand. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prophecy conference has a theme, and that theme is Liberty of Conscience Threatened. This weekend, we're going to be talking about how the things in the world are developing and how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy, and we are um, going to be spending time in the Bible so we can understand how the prophecies are designed and how they are unfolding. So you're going to experience a very wonderful um, time uh, in, the, in the study of the Word. And I'm going to begin tonight with a topic which is very current, very relevant. It's entitled, Is Mr. Trump and the United States Fulfilling Its Prophetic Role? So we're, we're going to look at uh, some current events to begin with, and then we'll, of course, begin with uh, other things uh, later on. But I'd like to begin with Scripture. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 is the center of end-time prophetic information that we get as God's people from the scriptures. And it is uh, full of content in detail of what to expect. Now, this is not the only place in the Bible where you get prophetic revelation. You get prophetic revelation from many places. In fact, all throughout scripture, there's prophecy everywhere. And uh, even the stories of Scripture have prophetic application to the last days. And there's many other things that we could uh, describe and discuss as well. But tonight I want to focus on Revelation 13. We're going to look at verse 2 and 3 to start with. It says, The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. This is a dramatic concept here. This is a dramatic prophecy. This is talking about the political aspect of Roman Catholicism as well as the religious aspect. A beast is a civil authority. But this civil authority is united with the religious authority, and so putting church and state together has uh, made this beast act very different from other beasts. Um, and it can only represent the Vatican. There's no other entity, no other global entity that qualifies or meets the description uh, or criteria of this beast and of what it does. Uh, it actually requires worship. Worship laws are the center of Revelation 13. In fact, some people think that the mark of the beast is something else other than worship. But Revelation 13 makes it clear at least five times that, there is, uh, that, that worship is at the center of end time events and it is the mark of the beast. So can you imagine a beast demanding the world to worship it? This is not literal language. This is figurative, it's symbolic language. Now, Islam cannot meet this description. It is not this beast because it does not have a global hierarchy that can enforce its will. Protestantism, which will play a major role in end time events, cannot be this global power either because, again, it doesn't have a global system with which to enforce worship. In the United States, perhaps there's a little bit of power there. I mean, it, there's military power, and it can enforce worship, but it is not a global power. 
well, it is a global power, but it's not a, 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 a global ruling power. And so far, it is still building its religious base. Notice that the Bible tells us that everyone, in verse 3, uh, all the world wondered after the beast. Everyone is going to um, uh, worship the beast, uh, except those who truly know and love Jesus Christ, that belong to Christ. And this is really the center of Revelation chapter 13, Christ. Christ and his law, Christ and his character, Christ and his people, that's the center of Revelation chapter 13. But it's also talking about those people in the world who have uh, no loyalty to Christ and who will uh, yield to the power of the beast to worship. Now we come to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. I want you to notice what it says. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, the worship is the central issue in the last days because so much revolves around worship. Uh, this is the enemy's way of bringing reproach on Christ and on his Ten Commandments, particularly the Fourth Commandment. Um, which is the Sabbath commandment. And since it's a sign of loyalty to Christ, the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to Christ, the enemy takes special aim at the fourth commandment and has succeeded in getting the whole world to disregard the Sabbath commandment, especially in defiance of Jesus. That's his goal, you see, uh, except, of course, for a very faithful few. Now, this should be no surprise, for all through history, God has always had his faithful Sabbath keepers. I don't know if you've studied much about history of the Sabbath or the Sabbath in history as it has come down to us in these last days, but there's always been somebody who has understood that the Sabbath is God's special day, his special mark. So he's always had his Sabbath keepers. But in every case, there were, they were always a tiny minority. They were never a large body of people. They were never in the majority. So God is not going to have numbers on his side or on the side of right. In fact, he ordains that the testimony of the Sabbath and the truth of righteousness by faith in the lives of his followers will be despised by the people of the world, whether they're Christians or not. They will treat them like the Jews treated Christ. Now think about that for a minute. That tells us that God's true people in the last days are headed for a serious crisis. The United States, however, is mentioned in Revelation 13 also. And it does play a role in collaboration with the papacy to bring about Rome's desired ends. Let's read it from verse 11. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Notice that the beast starts out lamb-like, but eventually speaks like a dragon. What does, this, what does this mean, speaking like a dragon? What does it symbolize? Well, who is the dragon? Satan is the dragon, that's right. Uh, and we get that from Revelation 12, verse 9. Let's read it. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Across the page here it says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So in other words, the, the dragon is Satan. The dragon is the enemy of Christ. The dragon is the one who wants to drag you out of Christ's arms and throw you to the flames. Really, that's what he wants to do, ultimately. So the dragon is the devil. And how does the devil work to get people to worship him? That's a very interesting process. That's the, that's the process of uniting church and state. But um, he forces them. The way he does this, his, his, his underlying modus operandi, his his underlying way of working is that he gets people to worship him by forcing them by human laws human punishments and thereby he gets them to obey him 
In other words, the Bible is saying that in the last days, there will be worship laws that Rome and the United States will enforce on the whole world by punishments and even death. And you can read that, of course, there in verse 15. Over the course of the last several decades, the United States has been diminishing in power. Now think about this. The United States has been diminishing in power um, and prestige as globalization marches forward. Globalization is the idea of bringing all the nations into a one world government controlled by a small body of individuals. Now, this is contrary to prophecy, uh, or, well, globalization is not contrary to prophecy, but America's decline is contrary to prophecy. Uh, as America declines, you know, prophecy says America is going to become great or powerful. But America has been declining, see? Now, um, the, the time is going to come, however, when that's going to turn around. And we have to understand or ask the question, has that happened? Or is, it, is that time come? Has the turnaround already started? If you're paying attention to what Mr. Trump is doing, you will see that he's uniting church and state together. I don't know if you've been paying attention to this, but if, you, if you're listening to what's happening and paying attention, you can see the evangelicals are swarming around Mr. Trump. But keep in mind that if there's ever going to be a universal worship law, there has to be a global political order, a global economic order, and a global enforcement mechanism. That's what a universal Sunday law will be designed to do. So it has to have these in place. These things have already been constructed to a large decree, degree in the world today. Globalization is marching on, even though Mr. Trump is actually working in some ways against globalization. It's ironic. So we need to keep paying attention. It's not going to stay that way. America has to become... Uh, powerful once again. Now look at what the Bible says next about this second beast. And, and we're going to look at this power. Uh, that's the United States, you see. In, in Revelation chapter 13, we'll look at verse 12. The Bible says about the United States, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Notice that he exercises all the power of the first beast, or Roman Catholicism. So what, what power, what kind of power did Roman Catholicism have when it had power, when it was um, able to, you know, uh, control worship? Well, that power was persecuting power. When you think about it, Rome persecuted anybody who didn't agree with her doctrines or didn't practice her um, blasphemous practices. That is ultimate power. When you, can, when you can kill somebody for not obeying your, your worship laws, your, your rules as a religious entity, that's ultimate power. And so Rome wielded power over the nations. It was a political power united with religious power. And those two things worked together to bring great trouble upon the faithful followers of Jesus, such as the Walden Seas, the Albigenses, and others scattered around Europe who followed the Bible. So she wielded her power over individual lives through kings and rulers with grinding cruelty. Uh, worship laws included. But she lost her power in 1798 when Napoleon's general Berthier took the Pope captive in Rome and exiled him and banished him. Now the Bible is telling us, however, the United States will achieve so much power that it will be able to persecute those who don't keep uh, the coming worship laws on a global scale. That represents a complete reversal of the present trend. You know, the decline of the United States. That's going to change. It's going to reverse. 
So when I saw the slogan that Donald Trump used as, as part of his campaign, I thought of this. What was his slogan? Make America great again. And I thought about this, this concept here in Revelation 13, that he exercises all the power of the first beast. America's, America's going to have to become very powerful once again. It's going to have to have prestige. It's going to have to have political muscle. It's going to have to have military muscle and police capabilities. You see, in order to fulfill verse 12, America has to become great. So making America great again fits the prophetic scenario. It doesn't really um, yet have all that power, you know. But somebody has to develop that power, and Mr. Trump is doing that little by little. And perhaps he has no idea what he's actually doing. You know, he, he doesn't know Bible prophecy. He doesn't know his Bible hardly at all, let alone these intricacies of Bible prophecy. But he's just pandering to his voter base. And indeed, that is what needs to happen for prophecy to be fulfilled. Right now, the left is doing everything they can to discredit Mr. Trump and to vilify him. You know, you listen to the news. Of course, he's not particularly righteous himself, but the point is that they do not want his conservative direction to develop very far if they can help it. For 50 years or more, the American left has been working to achieve their goals to push America so far to the left that it would accept and even extol perversions of every kind. They do not believe in constitution that restricts their desires. During the Obama administration, America was pushed so far to the left that conservatives didn't recognize it anymore. That's all extant. You know, that information is, is out there. So this created a reaction by the religious right, the conservative Americans. In response, now that Mr. Trump is in office, the left has come after him unrelentingly and tried to demonize him. This reaction of the Democrats to the, re to the reaction of the Republicans is so obvious. But nevertheless, there are still many of God's people who became confused by it. There's no reason why we need to be confused by this left and right. This is just, this is just the way politics works. You know, they're thinking, most of God's people are thinking about politics, my friends. They're not thinking about prophecy, so they get confused. They'll side with one or the other. Well, that's, that's dangerous because both sides have problems. You know, you, you can't expect that one political party is going to save America from ruin. No, they're all leading it all in the same direction. But let's think about the Hegelian dialectic that's involved here. You know, the left has pushed so hard for liberal advances, including and especially in recent times, the, LGBT, the LGBTQ+, among other things, that the right turned around and elected Mr. Trump to take America back in a conservative direction. In fact, it was the evangelicals that elected him, not just conservatives, or especially the evangelicals. That is the only group that he owes anything to, and he is certainly using their influence and paying them back. And, of course, evangelicals love Mr. Trump. Neither side has the answer to the problems America faces. There's no point in becoming political. God's people need to stay on the prophetic track. Our mission is to understand Bible prophecy as it applies to our times and to the events that take place around us. Anyway, think about Mr. Trump for a minute. He and the Republican Party are a reaction to the extreme leftist bent of the Obama administration. And now the left in taking back the House of Representatives for the Democrats is in part a reaction to the policies of Donald Trump and the religious right. The left, in other words, is both provocative and a preventive to the takeover of politics by the religious right. And the right is both a provocative and a preventive to the takeover of politics by the left. 
You see, they balance each other out or they, they, they are back and forth pushing each other perhaps to farther and farther extremes. This is called the Hegelian dialectic. It's a thesis, an antithesis, and then a synthesis. The synthesis is where Rome stands to gain and Rome will gain by the synthesis. After all, Rome and the Jesuits have a lot of influence on this very Hegelian dialectic. The Jesuits brag that if there is a barrier in the street, there's a Jesuit on both sides of it. This is public. They have been doing this for hundreds of years. Listen to how Ellen White describes them. This is from Great Controversy, page 234. The order of the Jesuits was created the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. Cut off from earthly ties and human interests, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience, holy silence, they knew no rule, no tie but that of their order, and no duty but to extend its power. Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume, vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. It was their studied aim to secure wealth and power, to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the reestablishment of papal supremacy. So there's two things. Their goal is to overthrow Protestantism and, Protestantism and to reestablish papal supremacy. They've already overthrown Protestantism. The Protestant voice is nearly dead. If any Protestant voice is left, it essentially resides among God's true and faithful people. What is left is for Rome to regain her power. And this is now happening apace, at a very rapid pace, really, when you think about it. Here's another very interesting statement from Great Controversy, page 235. You know, the Jesuits are still the same as they were. Um, they don't seem to uh, have the same negative influences, but a lot of that is disguised, you see, under the current way of doing things. Politically speaking, a candidate who has Jesuit training credentials has a good chance of achieving offices of state. Now let's look at at uh, Great Controversy 235. Listen carefully. It was a fundamental principle of the order that at the end, that the end justifies the means. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the interests of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state climbing up to be the counselors of kings and shaping the policy of nations. Remember that the purpose of the unity between the papacy and the United States, which isn't always on the surface, is to bring about worship laws um, and inflict civil penalties on those who disobey them, those who go don't go along. They will work however they can to achieve their goals. They bide their time. They've been biding their time for hundreds of years. So what is Mr. Trump doing to advance the prophetic scenario that the Bible predicts? I think it was interesting, as, I, as an aside, I just uh, noticed today, no, it was yesterday, that um, after the cathedral fire in Paris, the Notre Dame Cathedral, and Mr. Trump called Pope Francis to give him condolences. Now, that's, that, that, that's a link. That, that, ties, that ties them together. And he said, what a wonderful place this cathedral was. If you look at the history of the cathedral, you will know that many terrible things happened at that auspicious building. Maybe the fire is a sim symbol of what God will do to those who have done those things in the Catholic Church in particular at the end of time. Um, great Controversy, 
page 581. Great Controversy, page 581, predicts what is going to happen or what is happening now. And I'd like to draw your attention to this very important statement. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are only when it is too late to escape the snare. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Maybe it'll take some time to rebuild the cathedral in Paris. But I wonder if maybe that and other cathedrals and other massive structures will repeat the scenes that have disgraced them in the past in persecuting God's people as she's done before. She's piling up her lofty and massive structures in the recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. That statement is very important for us to understand. Stealthily, notice that word stealthily, and unsuspectedly, another important word to know. What does that mean? In other words, it's happening quietly. It's happening behind the scenes. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Again, that's Great Controversy 581. Okay, so there are some important elements there. But I want to point out that sentence that says Rome is silently growing into power and the one that says stealthily and unsuspectedly. How is this happening? Well, there are a lot of ways. Let me give you just one or two examples and I would like to show you <clears throat> how that is happening today in our time. Even as we sit here today and study these things out, these things are actually happening in the world around us. Perhaps you have not heard of a man named Leonard Leo. Has anybody here heard of Leonard Leo? Leonard Leo is doing something very important for Rome and to build the connection and the power of the United States uh, on behalf of Rome. Leonard Leo is a dedicated Roman Catholic. So dedicated, in fact, that he goes to Mass every day, if at all possible. But he is not a liberal Roman Catholic. He is a con very conservative Roman Catholic. He is the executive vice president of the Federalist Society. Have you ever heard of the Federalist Society? Yes, one or two. I've heard of the Federalist Society. In fact, I've run into a few of their books here and there, and I have a couple of them in my library. Um, <clears throat> the Federalist Society is a small, secretive network of conservative Catholics with over 70,000 members who are already responsible for placing four key justices on the Supreme Court. Already, four of them, four of the nine, are placed there by the Federalist Society. They've been around a while, too. Samuel Alito, John Roberts, Neil Gorsuch, and most recently, Brett Kavanaugh, all four of these judges are Roman Catholic or have Roman Catholic background, except for Neil Gorsuch. Well, Neil Gorsuch has Roman Catholic background, but he's not currently a Roman Catholic. He's Episcopalian. Um, but few people who know who the Federalist Society actually is. The Federalist Society nurtures, mentors, and grooms young lawyers for positions of high responsibility, such as federal judgeships, legal positions in government, uh, and, other, and in major corporations and the like, you see. They shape their government, and they shape their thinking, and they help them sort out their questions. They are only looking for conservative judges, the Federalist Society. 
And they go after the law students in the law schools around the country that appear promising in terms of society's uh, goals or their goals for society, perhaps a better way to put that. Over the last 20 or 30 years, the Federalist Society has been carefully developing a reservoir of judges for when a conservative president needs judges to nominate. He will not know them, the president, so he will have to rely on the advice of conservative counsel and leaders. The Federalist Society has positioned itself so that they can advise Mr. Trump concerning who to nominate for federal judgeships. In fact, they helped him develop a list of 25 potential Supreme Court nominees um, that he used, that, that Mr. Trump used in his campaign of 2016 to convince evangelicals that they should vote for him. One of the planks of his campaign platform was that the nominating that he would nominate very conservative judges because he will turn America's judicial system around from liberal to conservative at least that's his hope this is actually good news on many fronts and it was like music to the ears of the evangelicals and American conservatives the Federalist Society, guided by Leonard Leo, who is in turn guided by Rome, is becoming the pipeline to federal judgeships for many of Mr. Trump's nominees. It's not just the Supreme Court. Leonard Leo, the executive vice president of the society, is the puppet master. Uh, he knows everybody. That's important, anyway, in the judicial world. And uh, he understands the process. He has raised millions upon millions of dollars and is in the center of guiding Mr. Trump's judgeship nominations. The judges he recommends are not the usual conservative judges that eventually drift to the left. Oh, no. These judges that are being chosen by this individual believe in constitutionalism, originalism, and textualism. Three isms that go hand in glove together. Constitutionalism is a term that describes a judge who does not believe that the Constitution is a living document that must change based on the times and the circumstances, which would make the judiciary much more subject to political influences. Liberal judges believe that the Constitution can change with the times, you see, so he's not looking for that kind of judge. He's looking for lawyers that believe in constitutionalism. Secondly, originalism is the original intent of the founders or framers of the Constitution. These judges who are originalists uh, make their rulings based on the original intent of the framers as best that they can determine. And thirdly, textualism. Textualism is a term that describes a judge's commitment to act, the actual text of the Constitution, and they make their rulings based on what the text actually says. They don't fudge it. You know, they don't make it change over time. And by the way, Mr. Leo controls George Mason University uh, and it's Antonin Scalia Law School just outside of Washington, D.C., I drive very near to it when I drive to the airport. Largely because he raised huge amounts of money for the school. That's why he's got so much influence. And listen to what he does. He controls the uh, hiring of employees. He controls the enrollment of the students that come. And he controls the curriculum. So in other words, students that want to apply to the Antonin Scalia Law School would be vetted by Leonard Leo's uh, chosen few who would make sure that the background of this student is conservative, you see? So in other words, they're training conservative judges and they're then mentoring them and preparing them for important positions of influence. So he has a lot of influence on the school and he's shaping the school after his own likeness. In other words, He's shaping the curriculum so that the curriculum teaches the students to think like him. 
Man, that's pretty serious. Let me share with you a, a very f interesting set of facts. When Mr. Trump arrived in the U.S. president's office, he inherited an unusual number of open seats on the federal bench. 108, actually, compared to Obama's 54 when he entered office, including one seat on the Supreme Court. That's one-eighth of all the judgeships uh, in America and, 100, he, and 179 circuit court judgeships of, and, of course, nine Supreme Court justices. So, so in other words, there's, there's 673 district judgeships. Let me, let me say that again. 673 district judgeships. That's a lot, you know. And then there's 179 circuit court judgeships and then the nine Supreme Court. Anyway, that's, that's the details of how many judgeships there are, he got 108 of those, Mr. Trump, when he entered office, plus one on the Supreme Court. Mr. Obama had been trying to reshape the judiciary in line with changing society by appointing gay judges and other diverse individuals that aligned themselves with a leftist agenda. Someone once said to me, the only thing Mr. Obama did was to allow same-sex marriage. Friends, they were burying their head in the sand. He was doing what he could to change the whole nation to become gay-friendly. He promoted same-sex marriage. He, just, he didn't just allow it. He promoted it. He pushed for laws that would restrict religious freedom in the marketplace. He didn't just, you know let things happen, let the, let the courts take their course. No, he pushed for laws that would restrict religious freedom, uh, particularly in regard to abortion and gay issues. He was attempting to change America's judiciary to be friendly to those things. This is what prompted many conservatives who were very unhappy with the way America was going to vote for Mr. Trump. That's, how it, that's why it changed. Because of the opposition of the Republican Senate during Mr. Obama's last two years in office, not one federal judge was uh, confirmed during that last two years. And in all of his uh, time, 22 judges were confirmed, which is extraordinarily low in number. Most presidents get more judges, a lot more judges than that. Uh, through the process of Congress and its confirmation process. So Mr. Trump and his evangelical and Catholic advisors were handed a powerful tool of government that has mostly gone unnoticed by many, especially the Democrats. To appoint conservative judges is one of Mr. Trump's campaign promises, and he's done the, his level best to fulfill that promise. But it isn't just conservative judges in the usual order that eventually drift to the left, as I said. As mentioned, he is nominating judges that are ideologically committed to the Constitution. Even if Mr. Trump is replacing conservative judges or Republican judges with other conservative judges, which doesn't change the partisan makeup of the court, they are, they are much younger judges than usual, which means that they will be on the court for a very long time and they have this very strong ideology. So in his first two years as president, Mr. Trump has nominated 30 judges. Well, that, that was maybe a month or two ago, and maybe since then there's more. But anyway, uh, that's to the appeals courts, by the way. Way more than any other president, George H.W. Bush has the most after Mr. Trump. And he only had 21 confirmations. Mr. Obama had 22. All the rest of the recent presidents had less than that. And no doubt this is very gratifying to the evangelicals that surround Mr. Trump. Because they've got a Senate that is, that is of course, vetting their nominations. And uh, that Senate is, as Mitch McConnell said, um, they are confirming them like a machine gun. <laughs> well, that's... That's quite a statement when you think about it. But anyway, there are way more judges that have been appointed to the district court, 53 of them to be precise. Of course, that number may have changed by now. 
Remember, the man who's advising the president on judges is Leonard Leo, who is prone to recommending Roman Catholic judges or Roman Catholic-related judges, especially to the highest roles. Um, in other words, he can choose a few Baptists and a few Presbyterians and a Mormon or two or whatever for lower courts, particularly when they are very conservative judges. But for the top positions, like on the Supreme Court, that's another story. For instance, Leonard Leo recommended the nomination of Neil Gorsuch, Mr. Trump's first Supreme Court pick. Gorsuch was raised as a Roman Catholic, but attends an Episcopal church currently. And it is unclear whether he considers himself to be a Catholic or a Protestant. But his background, no doubt, influenced Leonard Leo greatly. Gorsuch was trained in Jesuit schools. In other words, he would more likely support Roman Catholic causes, especially as a conservative. Brett Kavanaugh, Mr. Trump's second court, Supreme Court pick, was also recommended by Leonard Leo. He is a very conservative Roman Catholic. And by the way, the fight over Kavanaugh wasn't about Kavanaugh. Not at all. It was about the shift in the Supreme Court to the right. Oops, to the right. <laughs> Democrats went all out to smear Kavanaugh to prevent, if possible, the shift to a more conservative court. They hoped President Trump would be forced to withdraw the nomination and pick a more centrist judge. The gradual shift on the Supreme Court from the majority Protestant to the majority Catholic has been significant. There is a reason for it, and it is Leonard Leo and the Federalist Society that has had a large part to play in it over the last couple of decades. You see, the Federalist Society has been around for a long time and has worked with conservative presidents for many years. Not liberal presidents. They don't, they don't typically go to the Federalist Society for their judges because they don't want those kind of judges. But L Leo doesn't just recommend. He knows these judges and once they're recommended or nominated, he then sets to work to prepare them for the battle over nomination and confirmation. They spend a lot of time rehearsing questions that will be raised in the Senate, opposition of the Democrats, and give him the talking points, the way to say things, and they work through any uncertainties or matters of importance to the success of the confirmation. Jeffrey Rosen, president and CEO of the National Constitution Center, made this very interesting observation. It is a fascinating truth that we've allowed religion to drop out of consideration on the Supreme Court. And right now, we have a Supreme Court that is religiously, at least, by no means, and by no means, looks like America. It doesn't, the Supreme Court is Roman Catholic, predominantly, except for a couple of Jews that are on the court still and one Episcopalian. So it doesn't look like the demographic of America. It's weighted way more to the Roman Catholic side than actual population of, the, of America. So think about what he said. He's actually saying that the majority Roman Catholic court does not reflect the way America is demographically divided. You know, I disagree with him that we've allowed religion to drop out of the conversation or the consideration. I think religion is a key factor in choosing Supreme Court nominees nowadays. You know, a, a, a liberal judge, uh, sorry, a liberal president would look for judges that are not going to be supportive of Roman Catholicism. And yet, even during Obama time, Obama's time, he no nominated a couple of uh, liberal, nevertheless, but Roman Catholic judges. It's very interesting because Rome has people on both sides, conservative and liberal, you know, doesn't matter to Rome. They use them, and when the time comes for a Sunday law, they will, they will follow Rome's lead. Anyway, Rome would not want that point to be made, that religion is actually a key factor in choosing Supreme Court nominees. That's, a, that's an observation that any student of Bible prophecy can make. 
All right? But anyway, remember, they're dedicated to silently growing into power, to stealthily and unsuspectedly gaining supremacy over America so that she can impose her Sunday laws. But the circuit and district courts are no less important than the Supreme Court. Actually, they're more important than the Supreme Court in some ways. During the whole of its last term, the Supreme Court only heard 69 cases in 2018. Hundreds of thousands of cases are processed by the district courts and tens of thousands by the circuit courts. In other words, the appellate courts are really important and they have the greatest impact on society because many times they set precedences that are not overturned by a higher court. In fact, most of the time, their decisions stand. Just certain key ones that, that uh, get passed on up the line. But the judges that Mr. Trump nominates are often vetted through the Federalist Society and in their connections. So Mr. Trump, whether he understands it or not, is actually helping Rome gain more influence, silently, unsuspectedly. Great Controversy 573. In the movements now in progress in the United States to secure for the institutions and usages of the church the support of the state, Protestants are following in the steps of papists. Nay, more. They are opening the door for the papacy to regain in Protestant America the supremacy which she has lost in the old world. Do you think that Mr. Trump and his evangelical advisors are uh, what they're doing with the federal courts is opening the door for the papacy to have more influence in America and to recover what she lost in the old world? Do you think that's happening today? I do. Silently growing into power, stealthily and unsuspectedly opening the door. These are words which describe what is actually happening in America today. On the surface, it looks as if nothing is amiss. It appears as if everything is all very good. It is even headed in the other direction, according to some people. But when you look at what is going on behind the scenes, at least what we can actually see and what we can actually document, much of it we cannot see, it tells a very different story. We are told that much of the behind the scenes work of the papacy to recover her power and league with nation states of the world will be unmasked. At some point, probably under the latter reign, God's people will be involved in the process. They will call God's faithful people out of Babylon for one last time and invite them to join God's true church. It will be a time of great conflict, including persecution by civil governments and civil authority. I want you to think about this for a second. Because if Rome gains power that she had in the old world, what do you think is going to happen to your worship freedom? Think about it. Are you ready for that? You know, um, as Rome gains more power, God's people also will gain more power. In fact, as Rome's power is ratcheted up, God's people's power through the Holy Spirit, is also going to ratchet up. And that's the beauty of prophecy. Because at the same time as, as these developments are maturing, God's power in his people is also maturing. You can expect that those who receive the latter rain will be standing up against the greatest powers of earth, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood up against the power of of the greatest empire of their times. So listen to this. This is from Great Controversy, page 606. The sins of Babylon will be laid open. The fearful results of enforcing the observances of the church by civil authority, the inroads of spiritualism, the stealthy but rapid progress of papal power, all will be unmasked. Now, let's think about this for a second. Um, the news media has been unmasking the various scandals of Rome, you know, the financial scandals, the sex scandals, the, um, the other evil things. That, you know, they're, they're matters of record. 
So what is left for God's people? Friends, the media has, does its thing because they, they don't want Rome's religion jammed down their leftist throats. You see, they, they don't want religion really at all. They don't like Christians. And as time goes on and, and as, as uh, the left and the right have become more and more polarized, it's become clear that anything that is religious, the left will shun it and they'll oppose it. So they don't want Rome's religion jammed down their throats. So they continue to expose Rome's, Rome for her iniquities that are you know, beyond the pale. You know. So what's going to be left for God's people? It's God's people that are going to have to call people out of Babylon. It's God's people that are going to have to expose Babylon. And they're not going to expose the sex scandals. They're not going to expose the financial scandals. They're not going to expose the other scandals. No. God's people are going to expose the false doctrines, the false principles of salvation that Rome tries to bring to the forefront. They're going to stand against Rome's Sunday, Rome's worship day, and uphold the Ten Commandments and the Fourth Commandment especially that God has given us. So in other words, your work is different from the media. You know, the media has alienated a lot of people from Rome. You know, there's a lot of people that just think that Rome's religion is rubbish and it's foolishness. But you're going to have to go a step further. You and I are going to have to expose the doctrines of Rome that have led to the corruptions, the underlying reason why Rome has the corruptions and scandals that it has in the first place, the blasphemies, the issues that Rome has on the surface are undergirded by these things, and you and I are going to have to bring those to the forefront. So the Bible is telling us, or the spirit of prophecy is also telling us, both of them, that the papal principles are going to be unmasked. And that's what's really important for us to understand about all this. We're headed, my friends, for a major crisis. And you know, it's amazing to me that some of God's people are starting to say, wait a second, great controversy can't be true because society is going all the other way. We're moving away from religious things. We're moving away from church attendance. We're moving away from religiosity in America. And in some quarters, that's true. And they might even want you to think that the overall majority of Americans are liberal. But they're not. The majority is actually conservative. Trouble is, they haven't been politically active until now. I see that the United States is changing. It's starting to to change direction. And Mr. Trump is the catalyst to make this happen. Now, we'll see what happens in the next election. Um, I can tell you this, that evangelicals who, elected Mr. evangelicals who elected Mr. Trump in the first place are very happy with him. Very happy. They overlook his own personal failings, his moral um, problems, they overlook that because they say, look, God uses faulty human beings. <laughs> you know, he used Nebuchadnezzar. You know, they, they say these kind of things. You know, so why can't he use Mr. Trump? And why can't we support him? Because he's doing the things that we want to have done. See? So they justify themselves. Um, you know, whether you see it as hypocritical or not, they justify themselves. Bottom line. They are supporting Mr. Trump, and they voted him into power, and they're very happy with him. Do you think that they will be able to vote him in again for a second term? Well, I don't know. We're going to see, and it's going to be a very interesting battle. It's already heating up. Mr. Trump is staying on the sidelines at the moment <laughs> um, because, obviously, there is so many Democratic contenders for president, he doesn't know which one he's going to be up against anyway. So he's going to wait for a while, I think. And we'll see what happens. It's going to be very, very interesting. 
Um, before we close, I would like to point out that um, Keep the Faith provides a monthly CD that discusses these things on a regular basis. If you're not a subscriber to our monthly CDs, I want to invite you to join our free subscription so that you can be part of learning and listening as you drive along in your car. We don't do, we don't do a sermon on video every month because... Um, at least at the moment, because most busy people don't have time to, they don't have time to sit and watch. So they can listen to this in their car as they travel along. Um, the Keep the Faith CDs look at the big issues taking place in, in the world from a prophetic point of view. We analyze them prophetically so that you, have in, that you will get prophetic intelligence out of them. I'd like to invite you to join our free subscription, fill out the pink card inside the, um, inside the uh, CDs that you can give to me before you leave and I'll, or mail it in if you wish. Uh, you can do it either way. We also have a subscription by email that comes out five days a week. One short email that takes up um, a little news item that you might have missed and we cast it in its prophetic context. That way, you will be able to keep up to date with prophetic intelligence. We call it the prophetic intelligence briefings. And we need prophetic intelligence in these last days, don't we? You know, I mean, we, the more we can get, the better. Because it helps us understand how close we are to the coming of Jesus. And my friends, I will say this. We are already starting to come up against the last great deception. Do you know what that is? You know what the last great prophetic deception is? to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. That has serious implications for us. We're coming up against that right now. Anyway, you'll want to be, be a subscriber because you'll get all that information uh, once each month through our monthly CDs. Also, I should point out quickly that there are three DVD sets. One is called Religious Liberty in the Age of Trump. One is called Fire Bell in the Night, and the other one is called Prophetic Secrets of the New World Order. You can buy these right here, or you can order them from Secrets Unsealed or from Keep the Faith. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for Bible prophecy. Thank you for all the detail that is included in Bible prophecy. And we thank you that we can see that it's being fulfilled today in every detail. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll bless us, teach us, and help us to understand our times, to be ready for the coming of Jesus in the clouds of glory. In his precious name, amen.